Good morning. Oh, everybody's still talking. Let's try that again. Good morning. All right, there we go. Now I know I got your attention and we can go ahead and get started here this morning. We want to welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning uh, to worship with us, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. We're so glad to have you as a part of our time here this morning. If you're visiting with us, if you're a guest this morning, uh, we want to especially welcome you. And if you wouldn't mind taking a moment in the pew in front of you, you'll find a welcome card. Uh, if you just take a moment, fill that out, and then you can drop it in one of the offering baskets on your way out. We'd love to have a record of you being here with us this morning. Our scripture reading comes from Psalm 29. I'm going to be reading verses 1 and 2 this morning. It says, Honor the Lord, you heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. And worship the Lord in, in the splendor of his holiness. Will you pray with me this morning? God, I pray uh, as we begin our time here this morning that that would be our focus, is to worship you, that our, our focus and our attention, um, whether it's through the time of singing or uh, as we open up your word here in just a little while, uh, that our focus would be on directing uh, that worship towards uh, you. And uh, I thank you that we can have uh, times like this. It was so refreshing to hear uh, some of the discussions from Sunday school taking place uh, this morning and, and the conversations and the learning that was taking place, Lord, and we pray for more of that. And we think about uh, the church, uh, not only here in Lawrence County, but around the world as, as uh, your church wor gathers to worship and meet here uh, today, Lord, we pray uh, that you would just be doing a mighty work, that you would be preparing us uh, for the ministry at hand, for the calling that you've placed on each one of our lives, Lord, and we thank you for that. We just ask that you would just go before us and lead us now in this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Bob. <coughs> Number three, three forty seven. <laughs> I lift your name on high, Lord, I love to sing your praises, I'm so glad you're in my life, I'm so glad you came to save us, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. And number 149, praise him, praise him. <coughs> Redeemer, for our sins he's 
suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Praise him, praise him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrow. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, love with Hosanna ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Prayers and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. In 142, worthy you are worthy. Then we'll go right into you are my all in all, 143. <laughs> worthy. Are worthy, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, you are worthy. Worthy, you are worthy, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, I worship you.
Amen. Now, I believe Brother Steve may come right down. Now, when Jesus is our all in all, there's amazing things that happen in our lives. This song is an old song. Let's see, it was, uh, well, it was copyrighted originally in 1940. But um, uh, the, the concept here of what happens in the life when Jesus comes in and makes those changes, as you listen to these verses, you're going to recognize a few stories out of the Bible. One sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay from home and friends the evil spirits drove him among the tombs he dwelt in misery he cut himself as demon powers possessed him. Then Jesus came and set the captive free. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Unclean, unclean, the leper cried in torment. The deaf, the dumb, in helplessness stood by. The fever raged, disease had gripped its victim. Then Jesus came and cast out every fear. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. So men today have found the Savior able 
they could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory, for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Well, this morning uh, I have the privilege of being before you, although it is uh, with heavy hearts uh, that I am up here this morning because Pastor Stephen uh, is in Iowa with his family. If you hadn't heard, uh, his dad did pass away uh, Thursday into Friday there, and so he left Friday, and I know Rachel and the kids, I think, were traveling today uh, to head over there, and so uh, we're going to take a moment and, and definitely pray for them and uh, definitely make sure to be praying for them. Uh, I believe the arrangements are for Tuesday, and so uh, especially on Tuesday morning, if you'll remember them in your prayers, I know that they would greatly appreciate that. So will you pray with me this morning? God, we uh, again just thank you for the opportunity that we can come here this morning to uh, worship and to open your word but also for moments like this where we can go before you and pray for uh, Pastor Stephen and their family uh, as they mourn the loss uh, of his father, but they celebrate the life and the ministry that he had and the impact, uh, not only on this world, but on their family. And so I pray that you would just be with them, that you would be with their travels, that you would be with them on Tuesday um, as they have that time together to remember um, and we pray that you would just bring them back safely to us as well. And we ask that you would just be with uh, every one of us here this morning as well. Uh, we know that when we came here, uh, we are all carrying burdens and cares and, and different things that are going on in, in our lives, Lord. And so I'm grateful for opportunities like Sunday school, uh, time before and after church where we can talk and we can pray. And so I pray uh, that as the body of Christ, we would do that, that we would see the importance of coming together to pray uh, about what's on our hearts, about what's going on in our lives, about what's going on in the world, because as we read scripture, we know that you can do great things. And if we want to see change, if we want to see uh, an impact, whatever it might be in our lives, in our community, in the world, it only happens because of you. So I pray this morning as we open your word that you would do just that, that you would challenge us, that you would prepare us, that you would equip us here for what we need as we exit here today, as we walk out, as we head to our schools, our jobs, our families, the community, wherever we find ourselves, uh, that we would have that joy inside of us that we carry of your word and the knowledge of what your son did for us and what he did for those who would accept uh, that work of the cross in their lives. And so we ask that you would just bless our time here this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you have a heartbeat, then you have probably a story that you carry along with you of a time where you faced fear. Uh, all of us have uh, moments where we've been faced with different fears in our lives, and one fear that I've seen brought to my attention more and more, whether it's TV, the news, or different things over the last few years, is, it hits home probably for even some of you here, is a fear of clowns. Uh, clowns can be scary. Uh, if you're afraid of clowns and not ashamed of that fear, I'd have you raise your hand, but we won't do that this morning. I won't make you admit that, that way uh, no one can use that against you. 
Uh, a few years back, uh, there would have been a healthy fear of clowns for most, because if you watch the news, uh, you would see that there were clowns popping up in neighborhoods across the country, from people's doorbell cameras and different things. Uh, most of you probably know the scientific name for a fear of clowns is uh, coulrophobia. Uh, there are a ton of crazy different phobias out there, but this one describes the fear of clowns. Uh, this one here, uh, blutophobia, is the fear of cleaning yourself. And as a youth pastor, one of the common jokes that runs around is we're convinced that junior hires have this fear, especially junior high boys. There is oikophobia, which is the fear of being touched by an appliance, or more importantly, just of your home surroundings, uh, which was a new one to me as I saw that one. And this one I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. I couldn't even find a breakdown of how to pronounce this. But some of you may have this, the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. It's crazy, right? It's funny to laugh at some of these fears. And some of you may have fears that you're thinking about as we talked about some of you. Um, you may not know me very well. A fear that I had growing up was arachnophobia, thanks to a movie by the same name, A Healthy Fear of Spiders. Um, you may know the fear of the person sitting next to you. You may know them very well or maybe not so much. So if, if we were in youth group this morning, this would be the time where I have you turn to the person next to you and reveal that embarrassing fear that you carry around with you. But again, I won't do that to you this morning. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that we all have fears. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld once said it this way, the number one fear of Americans is public speaking. And then second would be death. And so he said, at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. As we put all kidding aside, most of the time, the fuel we find to our fear is actually due to a lack of faith. We let fear drive our decisions instead of faith. And so what I want to help us to discover this morning is to learn how do we walk by faith in a fear-filled world. And so you might have saw at the beginning there, our, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3. So if you want to start making your way there, we're going to try to answer this question. How do we walk by faith in a fear-filled world? As you're making your way to Daniel chapter 3, many of you who have been in church for some time probably know this chapter very well. Uh, if you were here on Wednesday night, not too long ago, Pastor Stephen actually walked through the book of Daniel. And so you might re recognize this passage. You've heard the story. You've probably watched the Veggie Tales version over and over again. And so you probably know this story inside and out. But what I ask always as we approach Scripture, and even these most familiar stories, is that we would try to look at it with a fresh set of eyes. And that we would also acknowledge that the circumstances we see present here in Daniel chapter 3 aren't really that far off from the circumstances we see in our culture here today. Because the context of this book is that Daniel and his friends are living in a time, living in a climate where they find themselves under some political unrest. And I think as we watch the news, we would make that same assessment of the world in which we live in that there is a lot of unrest, even political unrest. We've seen over the last few years, there's been a fear and uncertainty over election results. Uh, will we be safe with or without a wall? Uh, we're seeing and hearing of war and the possibility of more war growing. And then on top of all those big things, in our daily lives, we too have to navigate the fearful circumstances and some potentially fearful consequences from our day-to-day -day lives. And so if we walk by faith in a fear-filled world, the question is, what should make our lives distinct as followers of Christ in the midst of these fearful circumstances? I'll read that again. What should make our lives distinct as followers of Christ in the midst of the fearful circumstances? 
This question doesn't refer to the word distinct as an external difference, like we think about, you know, what do we wear? You know, what movies or music are we going to listen to or see? But this rather goes a little bit deeper and asks the internal question. What makes us as Christians different? What sets us apart? How do we live faithfully for Christ in the midst of all this unrest? And so Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through 18, I'm going to read for us here this morning. It says, but some of the... uh, uh, Some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, and they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the burning furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power and your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Now, I know I dropped us right in the middle of this story. And so a little bit of context. If we go back to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we learn where what has happened to get us to this point. It's during the year that... King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, that King Nebuchadnezzar would come in from Babylon to Jerusalem and besiege it. And in verse 3 there, we see the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So he's taking the choice, uh, the top from Judah, from Jerusalem, and saying, You're going to come and work for me now. What we need to know is that King Nebuchadnezzar has taken these young men, like Daniel and his friends, who this book is written about, and that's the setting. The young men of Judah are taken captive under this pagan ruler and now being forced to live and to work in this foreign land of Babylon. So that's all fine and good, but once they're there and they're working and serving, we find the king kind of gets this big head and he decides, I'm going to build this giant golden statue. And everyone is to bow down and to worship the statue once they hear the music playing. Now, this wasn't an optional thing. This was a law. It was a decree. He sent out messages far and wide to tell the officials and governors and advisors of this new law. And what do we know? Even from today's world that we live in, if you break the law, there are consequences. Uh, The consequence for disobeying this law is that they would be thrown into the fiery furnace. The first principle from this story I want us to kind of see and take away here this morning. Maybe. You advance that, Drew. We'll not give you both of them just yet. A life of faith will be marked with conflict. If we look back at verses 13 and 14, it says, Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to worship or to serve my gods and to worship the gold statue that I have set up? Uh, Who were these guys? This is the biggest platform for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have this one little portion of scripture here 
where we get to learn about who they are and their background. Uh, we see from verse 12, it gives them uh, a whole lot of descriptors. There are some Jews, uh, a certain set of Jews here. They were a part of this exile from Babylon, uh, from uh, Jerusalem to Babylon with Daniel. And many of you know Daniel probably better than you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because the book deals more with Daniel than these men. And you know Daniel from his famous standing up to the king and Daniel in the lion's den. The first six chapters of this book deal with Daniel's life in the face of the political unrest from his vantage point. And it's in fact because of Daniel that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have the position that they do now. If you turn back to chapter 2, verse 49, it says, At Daniel's request, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon. That means they served as leaders. They were administrators in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And despite the fact that they were Jews, that they were foreigners, they had this position and power, which might explain to some degree the king's rage here in this moment that someone in his own cabinet would go against his wishes. That doesn't really look good, does it? Some even ask during this time, where is Daniel? You know, you expect Daniel to pop in and go, I agree with these guys. Like, yeah, I wouldn't do that either. Uh, some uh, question where Daniel was. Uh, some scholars say that he may have been on a, a call out of the region doing work, or he was in the king's court. Um, but we know, even in the, fit, in the midst of this political unrest, when we jump ahead to Daniel's story, he was willing to stand too, right? Uh, he had integrity and commitment to the Lord, and wasn't going to compromise. And we see that when Daniel stands up for the Lord, when he faced a similar threat of being tossed into the lion's den. So we find these young men were living a life of faith, and they're facing this conflict before him. What do they do? Uh, the conflict we see right here was a conflict between the king and them. Now, when you and I think most frequently probably about conflict, we think of what? Interpersonal conflict, right? That's what we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, we can relate to this because we have this kind of conflict with our family, right? Uh, or maybe uh, it's drama in your friend groups. Uh, a significant other, you might have some conflict there or even in the workplace. That's the kind of conflict we see here between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the king but before we get to this place where they have this interpersonal uh, mix-up, this conflict with the king, back in verse 11, we see another form of conflict, and that is at the internal level. In verse 11, it says, That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into the blazing furnace. A, a law was issued that didn't live up to their values. So before they even faced that external or interpersonal conflict with the king, they had to wrestle in their own hearts and minds with the fear in the face of this internal challenge and their values. It's no different in our time where lots of things fly in the face of our values and our culture. We're often asked maybe to do something that goes against what we know is not right. It's not good. It's not true. It's not beneficial for us. It contradicts God's word, these types of internal struggles will at some point show up in our lives. Most of us aren't in the verse 13 and 14 setting where we're standing before a leader of a nation. Uh, for most of us, the closest we've probably ever gotten to being in a furnace is singeing our eyebrows as we try to light our grills over the summer. But what we know is that each and every one of us probably at some point each and every day, face an internal conflict or struggle. These questions that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to face were literally this. Do I want to live or do I want to be faithful to my God? What is it that satisfies my heart more? There's a misnomer that is going around that if we follow Christ, that there's going to be this absence of conflict, that just because we follow Christ, we'll never have any arguments, there will never be any struggles going on, and that's totally not true. 
because as we said here, a life of faith will be marked with times of conflict. Jesus even says this in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. When we face this internal conflict, though, the temptation we find before us is to ask, what do I want the outcome to be? We start processing, running the numbers. How do I want this to work itself out? We're going to take a second and look at that here in a minute. But the tendency we find is for us to, what, try to control these outcomes. We, we want to be in control. And that's the wrong question here. The right question is, what would it look like to honor God in this situation? That's probably not the first thing that comes to our mind when we're trying to plan and plot things out and move forward. It's not what is going to be beneficial, what is going to honor God in these situations. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were literally staring death in the face. So if you would have been in their shoes, how likely would you have been to bow down to the king's statue? That's an honest question for us to ask as we read that. This is a good one because it helps us check our hearts and where we are here in this moment. We can't forget that not only were these guys facing death, but... You know, they're, they're thinking of, you know, I'm away from family at this time. You know, they're thinking about, is, will there ever be a day I get to see them? Well, if I disobey and die here, then I probably won't. Uh, they're like, we've been given this position of authority in the, the kingdom, so, you know, should we, shouldn't we? While we think maybe they were living their best life, this was probably one of the hardest parts of their lives here. These men could have justified obedience by just saying, we'll bow down, but we don't really mean it. That might sound familiar. You know, we try to rationalize things in our life. You know, I, I'm, I'm just going to do it. You know, it's, it's okay because I'm not fully invested. You know, I, I don't mean to do this. It's self-preservation. Uh, they could have said the position we hold in this kingdom demands our obedience. So we have to, we have to do this. Uh, they could have been asking questions uh, been bitter towards God. Where is God? He's the one who got us into this mess to begin with. Do we even still believe in him? A common way that we try to justify our own compromise is to say this phrase, and you've probably heard it. Maybe you've even said it. But God knows my heart. Yeah. But God knows my heart. You know, he knows I'm not doing this. You know, it, it's just for show. You know, it's just so, so a safe face, so it don't cause too many issues. The problem with that is that my life is simp- if my life is simply the overflow of my heart, then the greatest indicator of what's in my life is my life, how I live my life before others. What does that mean for us practically as followers of Christ? It means that it's our job to live in a way that is countercultural to the world in which we live in just like we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. We see before our faith is ever publicly tested, our values will be challenged internally. We've all experienced that internal conflict. When you come to that point, you have to realize, point number two here this morning, is that a life of faith obeys before we even know what the outcome is. Before that outcome is realized, we have determined that we are going to live our life in obedience to God. We see that in verses 16 through 18. It says, We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the burning furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power and your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. You see what they did there in verse 18? They're giving up control. They're not trying to rationalize. They're not trying to talk their way out of this. They're not trying to figure out how do we pivot here to save ourselves in this moment. It's our natural and human tendency to try to grab on and hold on to the control of the outcomes before us. 
Why? Because we think if we don't, it's irresponsible at best and scary at worst. And if we're honest, we have a hard time not trying to control the outcomes. I mean, we make plans early and often. What's the direction of our lives? Where are we going to work? Who are we going to marry? What friend or social groups will I be a part of? A life of faith obeys before the outcome is realized. Hebrews 11 chapter or Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of the things that we cannot see. Here in Daniel 3:18, we see these young men's choice to obey despite having no idea what the outcome would be. I mean, they knew what the law demanded. That if they disobeyed, they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they say, God, you can save us. And if you do, that's great. If you don't, that's okay too. Back in Daniel 3 here, they didn't serve the Lord because he assured them. They didn't walk in there with that assurance that they would be necessarily physically rescued from this situation. They knew it was possible. But that isn't what, why they served God. They didn't say, God will obey you if you reward us by saving us, by following through and saving us from this fiery furnace. In life and in ministry, I've heard a lot of people make promises to God so that they can maybe try to persuade him. We think we can persuade God to to join our side, to see it our way. Maybe it's in healing or to change the circumstances that we see before us. That's not believing in God. What we see is that's bargaining with God, right? We're trying to bargain our way and and have our influence, our say, our input in the matter. True faith confesses the Lord and obeys him regardless of the consequences or what lies before us. So how do we make that practical? What is it that stops us from living by biblical faith faith on a daily basis? Well, it comes back to that one four-letter word, fear. Fear is a form of not having full confidence or faith in God and his character. Fear is actually a subtle form of unbelief that we allow to take root in our lives. Faith is not meant to be just wishful thinking. Faith is obeying God based on one's confidence in the character of God. And that's exactly what we see modeled here by these three young men. Our job is to obey God and to do what? To leave the results in his hands. So how do we win the battle against fear on a daily basis, on a practical level? We have to come to an understanding that our fear is actually much, a much greater issue in our lives. Now, it's not just some subtle thing that's there, it's in the background, but it's an actual greater issue. It's an issue that is an all-out assault on the character of God. So practically speaking, what are some ways that we can win this battle? Here are a few things here. First one is, is that we need to renew our minds around the character of God. We have to come to an understanding and know who God is. The harder we believe or have faith isn't what sustains us. What sustains us is that object of our faith. See, I can believe as strongly as I want that the moon is made of Swiss cheese, and that's probably what we all thought as kids, right? It looks with the craters like Swiss cheese. But no matter how hard I believed that, It isn't true, right? So what is true about God's character that we can know that will help us put our faith in him? And we got to go to scripture so we can learn about who God is. Philippians 4, 19 tells us that he is a personal God. It says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He is a personal God. Colossians 1.17 says he is a sovereign God. He existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. This reminds us he is in control of a life uh, in this world that sometimes seems out of control. Lamentations 3.22-23 says he is a faithful God. 
says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. And it says they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Finally, Romans 8.28 says he is for us. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Not favorable circumstances, but for our spiritual benefit. Now, these are just a few hand-picked ones. There are so many more of the char- characteristics of God throughout Scripture that we should know. We should renew our minds around these verses and these other truths that we find within God's Word and meditate on them daily. Uh, what? We are called to what? Hide God's Word in our hearts. That's one of the reasons why memorizing Scripture is so important and it's considered a spiritual discipline. Another truth that we see in a practical way that we can wage war against fear is to grow in your love for God. 1 John 4.18 says, Such love has no fear because perfect love does what? It expels all fear. We see long before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced the pressure of verse 18 and even verses 13 and 14, they had to determine way back in verse 11, we said, how are they going to respond when their core convictions and values were challenged in this moment? For us, just as with these young men, this type of response doesn't happen on the spot. We find it's an overflow. It's an overflow of our intimate relationship with Christ. The decision can be made easier when it's made out of that overflow of our relationship with him, rather than us trying to figure it out on the spot, in the moment, or trying to go backwards. The final practical step here this morning is we need to live with an eternal perspective. The Apostle Peter speaks to this in 1 Peter chapter 2. And in verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents, as foreigners, to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. So just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we live as foreigners in this land. We live as foreigners in this world that we find ourselves in. And Peter uses a phrase here to keep away from, while some other translations may say abstain. Why does he say this? Because the worldly desires wage war on our souls. Our hope isn't to be here. Yes, God wants us to enjoy this along the way. But because of sin, this isn't how it was meant to be left. We are to treat this current world as if we're residents in a temporary world. We're longing for that restoration that Jesus is bringing about. But fear tells us that we're not temporary residents of this world. Instead, it says, this is your permanent residence. Get as much out of it as you can. You know, enjoy it while it lasts. I heard a story about a young girl, and hopefully this helps us kind of see the eternal perspective. And the the crazy thing is, is I have stories like this because I work with youth. And so to hear what happens with other students uh, hits home. But a middle school girl, she caught fire for Jesus and was so passionate about seeing her friends, her lost friends, come to meet Jesus. So what did she do? She made a commitment that she would share her faith and invite her friends often. She kept doing this so much so until her mom had to actually get the church van so that she could bring her friends because she just kept inviting more and more. Then it got to the point where they needed a, a second church van just to bring her friends. That's just one student. Then eventually they looked into getting a bus 
to bring these friends of just this one student. What they found was this girl had a hand in absolutely transforming her middle school for Jesus, and all of her friends knew about her faith. And many of them came to accept Jesus as a result of that influence in their lives. We say that because we think, well, the easiest thing she could have done, she could have she could have shrunk back and been afraid. You know, what, what will my friends think of me if I share? That's, that's one of the common things that we think of. You know, what are people going to think of me? What are they going to say? Will they still be my friend? Instead of letting that fear and those thoughts cloud her mind and her judgment, she decided to lean in. She didn't let fear drive and determine what would happen. Instead, she determined that she would be on mission to reach her friends for Jesus being obedient to the command that we see here in Scripture. The thing I want us to see is that if God has us here, he has you here, you're, you're here another day, you're breathing. You're here on this planet, he has something for you. And the thing that will hold us back from realizing that or stepping out is fear. I'm really bad at this, and Rachel can call me out. I saw her walk in, so I was like, oh, man, she could, she could stand up and tell me. There, there's a million excuses we can come up with, and I'm good at doing that, coming up with excuses why you know, not to do something. or you know, That's where my mind sometimes goes first. Why shouldn't I do this? What I want to challenge myself and challenge you this morning is, is there something that you feel the Holy Spirit has been nudging you? You know, you've been hearing it, you've been like, ah, I don't think that's, I don't think that's the Holy Spirit telling me to do that. You know, all right, it's not perfect timing, I just, I'm not feeling it today. Do you feel that the Holy Spirit is nudging you to something this morning, even if it's scary? Because that's the reality, that's the reason why we don't want to hear it or we don't want to act. Will you this morning take a step back instead of making an excuse as to why it won't work? You look and see like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Will you see like others in your life? Maybe it was a person who led you, who stepped out in faith to share Jesus with you, to reach you for the gospel. Instead of allowing fear to take you back or to remain silent, will you look to take that step forward? To answer that call, to at least seek out, okay, God, what are you, what are you calling me to? What are you saying? What does this look like? My encouragement this morning is instead of going backwards in fear is that we would take that step forward. What a crazy thing, especially if we all started taking a step forward, how much the church would be changed, the church would be transformed, but even your own life would be changed and transformed when we start saying, I'm going to live in obedience before I even know the outcome. Or I even know how somebody's going to respond as I share. Or if I start this new ministry or this new venture that, you know, it may fail. It may, it may take off. I don't know. But, you know, I feel like I'm being called to do this. What is that this morning? We're going to take some time to pray, and then we're going to do our invitation. And maybe God's been laying something on your heart. That you can come up and you can pray. You can pray in your seat. You can see me afterwards, and we can talk through that. What does that look like? But that challenge here this morning to take that step forward. Will you, will you pray with me this morning? God, I know it's true in my life, and I hear that voice in you calling and challenging uh, different ways in which you want me to step out, to lead, to, to be bold for you. And so I know if that's true for me, it's true for each and every one in this room who calls themselves a believer. And so I pray this morning that we would see this as an opportunity to take that step forward, that we would be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we would uh, stand boldly in our faith and our convictions, that we would know what is right and true. But we can't know that unless we dig into your word, until we uh, get to know who you are and, and, and who you created us to be. And so I pray this morning as we enter this time of reflection, Lord, that you would just be speaking to us, that you would be speaking to our hearts, what is that one thing? 
Uh, we don't have to take a big chunk or a big bite. There's that one thing that you were calling us maybe to do here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just lead us, that you would guide us, and you would move us forward in that thought, that idea. And let us just look and lean on you here this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. One of the scariest things is taking that step in following Jesus. And so a lot of you have already done that. Uh, you've tackled that fear to the ground. But again, as we kind of close our time here this morning, what's that one thing, that fear in your life that's holding you back? Will you commit that to the Lord here this morning? Uh, we're going to have our musicians and Bob come and lead us. And I don't have the song of invitation in front of me, so I'll let them introduce that. But again, during this time, if, if you need to come and to do some business with the Lord, now is that time. Number 435, just as I am. <clears throat> just as Again, we're so glad to have you. You can be seated for just a moment. Uh, just a couple announcements that we want to remind you of. Hopefully you grabbed a bulletin on the way in. If not, make sure to grab one on the way out. It's a souvenir because Pastor Stephen's sermon notes for next week are in there, ready to go for you. So if you want to sneak peek or do some uh, studying ahead of time, uh, maybe you can come in with some, some pre-knowledge and things. You can even quiz him on what he's going to be speaking on. But uh, we always uh, appreciate your giving, and uh, if you would like to give, you can give online, you can give in person, you can mail uh, still to the church. The offering boxes are at each door on the way out. Um, the ladies' luncheon. Today is the final day to sign up for the ladies' luncheon. That's going to be on May 21st, and so uh, you'll find sign-ups down on the table there if you wouldn't mind just making sure to have that done by today so that they can make arrangements for food and the different things that they're planning. As far as I know, we still need some men to volunteer uh, to help serve. And so I know they need at least six, but we would take more if you, if you have more. And so uh, obviously Rachel's gone. Uh, you can see myself, Kyleen, or I think even Brenda volunteered uh, to, to be a, a contact for that. If you would like to help serve the ladies, please see one of us before you leave. And uh, this fifth Sunday, uh, you know, fifth Sundays, we've been trying to do things different. Uh, as we gather together, whether it's a trivia night, a uh, just discussion night, whatever it might be, we are doing a movie night. And so we're going to watch the movie Overcomer. You've probably seen the posters uh, around the church. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a great movie. If you've already seen it, come again. It's a great movie. Um, so we'd love for you to come. We'll be in here in the sanctuary for a time of fellowship and to watch that movie together. And so we'd love for you to come and to be a part of that. The choir is meeting tonight at 5 o'clock, so that's for choir members. And I know Steve would appreciate if you haven't joined and would like to, you can still come out. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, you have to join at the beginning of the year. You can come out and join them uh, as they uh, learn new songs and practice together. They have a, a really good time. I come in early and I can hear them sometimes. And they try to bring me in, and I'm like, no, you don't want that. So uh, I'll keep my distance, but... Uh, they would love for you to come out and to be a part of that ministry as well here this morning. 
with that, I would like to encourage you uh, and hope and pray that you have a great day today. I welcome you to come back tonight as we'll open up the word again here this evening together. With that, you are dismissed this morning.